Here's something fun. Celebrate spooky season with Parcast Presents Halloween. This new podcast series on Spotify brings you three blood-curdling episodes each week in October. From urban legends to haunted places, Parcast Presents Halloween takes you on a historical tour of terror. Hear the stories of an escaped killer on the prowl, a gruesome discovery by four young friends, the legendary killings of Salem's first witches, and more. Search for Parcast Presents Halloween in the Spotify app and start listening now. Ooh, don't scare the listeners. True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. 22-year-old Taylor Sampson left his fraternity on the night of August 15, 2015. He had only a cell phone and a large black duffel bag as he walked out the door, telling his girlfriend he would be back soon. She knew that he'd been dealing in some drugs, but Taylor tried to keep his life with her separate from his life as a drug dealer. He was in college, studying physics, and selling drugs was supposed to be a temporary way to pay the bills until he graduated. Justin Blades and Pokeel McCabe, two other college students, were hanging out in McCabe's apartment when they heard a gunshot. 23-year-old neighbor, William Sanderson, came to their door in a panic. Money, drugs, and blood were on his apartment floor. Taylor Sampson has never been found. Join us at the Quiet End today for Blood Money. Why were these two bright and promising students so deeply involved in the drug trade? And what really happened to Taylor Sampson? So we're going to do a Canadian beer today. Uh, and I even picked one from Halifax, Nova Scotia, where this med school is. So the beer is called Schooner. It's an American adjunct lager. Uh, it's brewed by Alexander Keith's Brewery in Nova Scotia, Halifax, in fact. So it's a gold color, little tiny white head, tiny bit of lace. Not much going on here, folks. But that's okay. Sometimes <laughs> you're not looking for anything more than just refreshment. Sure. Uh, it's got a nice aroma of sweet malt and grassy hops, and the, the taste pretty much follows that exactly. Sort of sweet graham cracker or caramel type stuff and uh, those uh, outdoorsy grassy hops. Very crisp. Uh, nice, nice refreshing beer. As I said, it's not a great beer. But if I were having to choose between this one and Budweiser, I would take a schooner. That's a rave review. <laughs> good news. See? Yeah, I, I like it. I try to do pretty good on that one. Okay. So let's open this up. It's a pretty low alcohol by volume, so we can share a six-pack or a 12-pack with uh, the denizens of the quiet end. Okay. All right. Let's go down to the quiet end. Okay. So why don't you start us out, because you're on a roll. You're doing great. <laughs> yeah, aren't I? Mm-hmm. You are. Okay. So Taylor Sampson is the victim in this case. It's important to note that he was well-loved, and he seemed to have great potential. However, even though he's a good student with a strong work ethic, he is dealing drugs. And it might be relevant to consider why he made that choice. Oh, I absolutely think so. But first, let's discuss Taylor's childhood and his young adulthood. You know, like including what brought him to the place where he was killed at just 22 years old. Yeah, and you had mentioned in, in the intro that drug dealing was a sidelight just till he graduated. Well, I, I always I have to laugh at those kinds of statements because I don't think that's 
what's going to happen or would have happened. Well, I mean, you hear it all the time with like strippers, drug dealers, you know, even working some crappy job I've done. I've said, well, this is just temporary. Right. And I think at least we know that the hope was that it was temporary, whether it would have worked out or not. I mean, he was a smart kid. Yeah, he, well, he was. He was a physics major. Yeah, uh, so maybe after graduation, he could have really become something legitimate and done well for himself. He could have. But, you know, I'm thinking he'd graduate and he'd be looking at the types of money he'd be bringing in and he'd say, well, I can make more money dealing marijuana. Sure, but that's the negative side. I know. It I'm, could have gone either way. I'm trying not to be negative. Okay. Okay, so Taylor was born in March of 1993, and he lived in a suburb of Halifax. When he was born, he was 22 inches long, and the pediatrician told his mother, Linda Boutelier, that he would grow up to be over six feet tall. That's kind of wistful thinking. You can't just look at a baby at birth and say this is how tall he's going to be as an adult. No, well, when can you decide that? Well, you can do it a variety of ways. You want me to put my doctor hat on? Sure. So one way to do it is you can do what's called mid-parent height. So if you assume that your parents are both representative of their families in terms of stature, I can take mom's height and dad's height and with a fairly simple formula, give an estimation of how tall a male baby or a female baby would be as an adult. That's a quick and simple way. Without but how anything. accurate can that be? It's fairly accurate. Really? Yeah. I'm surprised. Uh, again, that's assuming that these are representative samples. Okay. Now, if if the mother's five feet tall and every female in her family is over five six, that skews it and that's probably not going to work. But if they're representative, then you can always, as the child gets older, you can do an x-ray of their hand and do what's called a bone age. And you can get a pretty accurate measurement of adult height from that. So you think that doctor was just kind of throwing it out there without any real way of knowing? Yeah, he's just talking. 20 inches is kind of the average length at birth. Sure. So 22 is above, but that doesn't mean he's going to continue growing that way. Although this kid did. He was over 60. Wasn't he like 6'5 or something? He did end up being 6'5, yeah. yes. So, so his doc was right. That's right. Taylor was Linda's first child. She hadn't planned this pregnancy, but she was 32, and she was happy to have him. And she had another son two years later, and his name was Connor. Now, Linda had been with her son's father for a few years, and the future looked pretty bright. Yeah, I mean, they were working class, but everything seemed to be going pretty well. It seemed like life was going to work out okay. According to Linda's interview with the author of a book on this case titled First Degree, From Med School to Murder, that's Kayla Hounsel. Taylor was really advanced for his age. Linda said he was inquisitive and active, talking by eight months of age, and running around before he was even a year old. Taylor started preschool when he was three and a half, and he was a friendly kid, also noted to be very protective of other children, including his younger brother. Then, as a young man, Linda would say that Taylor wanted to take care of the people he loved especially her and his brother Connor, who had autism. Yeah, and like most brothers, or most siblings, not just brothers, sisters will do this too, right, Jill? Worse than the boys, I think. Connor and Taylor fought often, but if anyone else threatened Connor, Taylor was there to defend him. Now, their lives had hardships, and Taylor decided at a young age that he would take on the responsibility for his family. When he started school as a five-year-old, his parents broke up. When he was seven, he and Connor moved to Amherst uh, with their mother, and this is about 125 miles away from where he had been growing up. Bit of a change. Yeah, and Linda was working as an LPN in a nursing home, but she eventually found the shift work was too difficult with two young kids at home and no one to help her out. Also, she started to have back problems, and she couldn't continue doing the lifting, that's needed to do in her nursing home job. As a result, Linda spent most of her working years at Walmart or fast food jobs. So because of that, she made less than $30,000 a year, which made each month kind of difficult. I mean, just making the bills and providing the necessities for her sons was a struggle for her. 
Yeah, and Taylor wanted to grow up and make more money so his family could live a more privileged life, or at least a more comfortable life. Dad was not involved in Taylor's life on a very regular basis. Now, according to Taylor's friends, he started selling pot when he was 14 or 15 years old. His mother refused to believe that, and she said that he didn't start dealing until the summer before he left for college. He had quit his minimum wage job, but he had a lot of money that summer. Linda said that she actually confronted Taylor after she noticed the money, and also that people were kind of coming and going at the house. And Taylor admitted to her that he was dealing, but he said it was only a few grams here and there to friends. So this wasn't too upsetting to Linda because she was used to many of her friends and neighbors smoking pot. So she really didn't worry about it too much. Well, okay. Well, I know. I would be very worried. Yeah. I mean, once he starts college, she did encourage him to to quit dealing. Because her main concern, to me rightly so, would be that he'd get caught, found out, and he'd get thrown out of school. And this would really jeopardize his future. Sure, and I don't know if it really matters if you're dealing a little or a lot. You're still getting involved with dangerous people. And you're breaking the law. You're putting your life in a lot of jeopardy. You are. But Taylor couldn't make ends meet on his student loans. And also, Linda kind of got behind on her own rent. So the money he made selling drugs was really useful to them. Which is a shame. It's really too bad. Yeah, but this was how he was able to, uh, again, not, not just live his life, but he helped financially for his mother. Yes, yep. That's why I can see more why he got into it than William Sanderson, but we'll get into that. Because Taylor was just really proud to be able to help out his mom and brother because money was always an issue. And he was getting good grades. He had a girlfriend. He'd even joined a fraternity. He was studying physics and planning on getting his PhD one day. So he had great goals. Really some good goals going on. Well, yeah, and and he's a smart kid. Very smart, yes. Now, when he did disappear, he was dating a girl named Mackenzie, and they had been together for several months, and Taylor's mom really liked her. They had girlfriends before, but Mackenzie was by far the most serious one. Yes, she was actually planning to go to med school. Taylor was a very tall guy. Yeah, very athletic, too, and kind of a charmer. Yeah, and then Mackenzie was a little teeny thing. Pretty face, long, thick brown hair. Yeah, these two made a cute couple. Taylor was a natural-born salesman, but his mother hoped that he would find a product other than drugs to sell. He tried several small businesses, including a YouTube tutoring business and a smoothie shop. He'd also tried a multi-level marketing business, and he considered getting a real estate license. So he really was motivated to make money. Just about everyone in Taylor's life knew about the drug dealing, though. And by the time he got to college, many of them were just really encouraging him to quit. It's a dangerous thing to do. But he didn't seem to realize how dangerous this could be for him. When he went to meet William Sanderson in August of 2015, Taylor clearly had no idea that he was a target. Now, William Sanderson, the guy who's going to collide with Taylor had had a much easier life to this point than Taylor had. He was raised on a family farm with his middle-class parents, Laurie and Michael, and three younger brothers. Well, William was born in 1992, so he's about 23 years old when Taylor disappeared. William and his family are happy most of the time. They took vacations every year, usually to warm popular tourist spots. William was able to visit Europe on a school trip in high school. Yeah, but you know, the Sandersons weren't wealthy. They were just hard-working, caring parents. In addition to running the family farm, Michael Sanderson worked hard. He delivered bags of feed to other farmers, driving a route of deliveries. And Lori Sanderson had a job with the Department of Agriculture. Now, they were both very devoted to their four sons. Yeah, and that farming is not an easy life for a very lucrative life, is it? No, I mean, I think that's why they had to work additionally. Oh, sure. They had actually purchased the farm from Michael's parents and were really trying to make that work, but he still had to work this delivery job for an extra twenty-five or $30,000 a year just to be able to provide the kids with everything that they needed or wanted. 
so William's parents were very proud of him. He had graduated from college, and he was accepted to medical school. He was athletic. He ran track in high school and in college. Some of his classmates said that William was really spoiled, though, and kind of weak. He didn't seem to have a mean bone in his body, but he had a temper that he would lose sometimes when he had been drinking. He'd get kind of, um, to be a mean drunk. Not a witty and charming one. No. (laughs) And he also, it turns out also that, like Taylor, William dealt in drugs. I don't know that he was as sophisticated or had as big an operation as Taylor, but he, he sold drugs also. Yes. Yes, definitely. Quite into it, I think. Sonia Gassus, William's girlfriend in 2015, was attractive. She also ran track, so that was something that she and William had in common. She knew that he dealt drugs, but she tried to ignore it, and it was something that they really didn't discuss. After William quit his job as a personal trainer in 2014, he began working for a nonprofit organization, helping adults living with disabilities. He worked hands-on at home with three residents, and he was responsible for their food, their medication, their transportation, as well as their personal care. He also was working as a patient attendant in an emergency room, getting some experience that would look good on his medical school applications. So William didn't get into Dalhousie Medical School on his first try. Now, it's common for Canadian students to attend medical schools in the Caribbean when they're rejected at Canadian schools. So William went to Saba University's School of Medicine. Saba is a municipality of the Netherlands in the Caribbean, but the credits earned from Saba were not transferable. So his attendance there didn't help with medical school. But what it did do was cost him a bunch of money. It did. He spent about five months at Saba Med School before he returned to Canada. And he was just days away from beginning his classes at Dalhousie Medical School when Taylor Sampson disappeared. Yeah, so in his second go-around of applications, he got into Dalhousie. Yes, he did. So he's ready. He's out of college. His short stint on Saba is behind him, and he's ready to become a doctor. That's what he thought, yeah, but he was still doing bad things and had even worse things coming up in his future. (laughs) That's for sure. So Taylor Sampson was last seen on August fifteenth, two 2015. This was a Saturday. According to his girlfriend Mackenzie, suspicious things started happening the Thursday before he was last seen. A group of friends were hanging out in the common room of Taylor's apartment when a man named Devin showed up with a black duffel bag. Now, Mackenzie had never seen him before, but Taylor clearly knew who he was. So Devin and Taylor went upstairs to his bedroom and returned a few minutes later without the black bag. Mackenzie would describe this man as tall, with short brown hair, and a rough-looking face, whatever that means. She also noted that he was socially awkward, and that he left soon after he came back downstairs. So it seems the only reason he was there was whatever was in that duffel bag. Which he was dropping off. Yes. He came with it and left without it. He did, so I don't know if he got money in exchange for it. We're not sure. Now, on the 15th of August, Taylor played baseball, and he and Mackenzie had plans to go out with friends that night. Now, he was still in the process of moving into his new apartment at a fraternity house, and according to Mackenzie, he seemed a bit restless and distracted. 10.30 that night, Taylor told Mackenzie that he was going a couple houses down for a few minutes and would be back soon. He took his cell phone and the black bag from Thursday that was dropped off, took that with him. Mackenzie knew that Taylor sold drugs, right? And so she figured that the black bag had marijuana in it, likely full of marijuana. So yeah, Mackenzie figured that that bag was full of marijuana, right? That's what she's figuring. Because that was the main thing he sold, although I think he did sell other drugs. He dabbled in other drugs. Sure. So William Sanderson went to work on August 15th. He got home from work a little after 5 p.m., His girlfriend, Sonia, had dinner with him at a Halifax restaurant that evening. Over dinner, William told Sonia that he was having some people over to his apartment that evening, and she shouldn't be there. 
So that was kind of like code that he was doing a drug deal. Sonia made plans to go to a friend's house nearby, and she and her friend watched a movie. After the movie, Sonia called William, asking if she could return to his place. Because she wanted to get to bed, she had to work early the next morning at Starbucks. And William told her that she could return between midnight and 12.30 a.m. <laughs> Makes you wonder what's going on there, huh? It really does. So when she did return to William's apartment, it smelled really strongly of bleach. Now, William told Sonia that one guy attacked another guy in the apartment, and that one of them bled everywhere. So he was pouring bleach all over the place to get it cleaned up. Well, that's just strange. <laughs> Isn't it? It is. Plus, she would say that William was really worked up and kind of agitated when she got there. And once they were in bed together, she noticed that he was really sweaty and his heart was pounding really fast in his chest. So something was up, and I think she had some kind of idea. Of course, she had no idea what. Right, but it's, it's fairly obvious that something happened. Yes, I think so. So they woke up early the next morning. William drove Sonia to work. He himself went to work around 12.30 that day. And a co-worker would describe his behavior as pretty normal for him. The only unusual thing she noticed was that he was coughing. And he said that he was doing that because he had inhaled some bleach fumes. Well, that'll irritate your respiratory system, right? Yes, well, I suppose so. But other than that, he acted pretty normal. He and the co-worker took the three residents out to do their errands, and he seemed to be interacting pretty normally with everyone. He did do some of his own laundry with the residents, but that wasn't that unusual. He had done that before. Sonia was on Facebook that day when she noticed posts about Taylor Sampson. He was missing. She asked William if Taylor was the guy who had bled in his apartment the night before. And William said no. So she knows that William and uh, Taylor are acquaintances. Yes. She knows that they have a relationship. Well, I don't know if relationship seems a bit of a stretch. They knew of each other. They'd met a couple times. Yeah, but she didn't know that he was going to be at William's apartment. No, but remember, William had told her that two guys had gotten in a fight at his apartment. Right. And right. someone had bled on the floor. So when she heard Taylor was missing, she just asked him, is he the one that had bled in the apartment? Because she, she probably knew Taylor was into drugs as well. Well, yeah, that's what I was getting at. Sure. Yeah, I think they were acquaintances through their drug activities, but I really couldn't say that they were friends. But the girlfriend must have had some suspicions because she asked William if he knew what had happened to Taylor. And William denied that. He told her that he was going to quit dealing and that he was already working on cutting ties with the drug people. So he was telling her he's pretty much out now. If only that were true. Well, well maybe at this point it is. <laughs> well, I think he was thinking he could leave it after making a final score, maybe. But, of course, things aren't going to go his way. No, and I would think also, here he is starting med school, and probably the last thing in the world he wants to do is, is get caught dealing drugs and get kicked out of med school. Sure, so maybe he was starting med school in a matter of days, so maybe he decided, I'm not going to sell drugs anymore. But for some reason, he felt like he had to do this final drug deal. Maybe. It's a bigger buy than he usually did, right? Oh, I think so. As far as we know, sure. Yeah. So two days after... Uh, Taylor disappeared, two police officers showed up at William Sanderson's work. They had searched Taylor's phone records, and they believed that the message to Taylor Sampson on August 15th, the day he went missing, had been sent from the computer at the group home where William worked. Right. So that was just one of the messages as they examined Taylor's phone records. But two of William Sanderson's co-workers were interviewed by the police for a couple of hours. When they left, a worker texted Sanderson and asked him if he knew Taylor Sampson. This was after midnight on the morning of August 18th. Then Sanderson answered this call at 8 a.m. and thanked her for a heads up. So it took him a while to get back to her. Yeah, well, he's got things to do. Sure. Cover his tracks. Then the next day, the supervisor heard about the police visit, and he called the primary investigator on the case. Then the supervisor called 
William to tell him that the police wanted to speak with him. So this might not be looking so good right now. At 11.30 a.m. on the 18th, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Sergeant, Charla Ketty, was trying to reach William Sanderson. She left him a voicemail as well as a text. He did call her back a short time later, and he agreed to meet with her at the Halifax Police Headquarters. So when he arrived for his interview, it was about 1 p.m. that day. But he wasn't a suspect. He was a very cooperative witness. He was casually dressed in a t-shirt and shorts, but he was asked to tell this sergeant about how he knew Taylor Sampson and when was the last time he saw them. So he's already being looked into, even though he's not technically a suspect. Right, and, and he's going to try to mitigate things by telling them, oh, I kind of knew him, we weren't real close, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but it won't take long for them to figure out that he is a suspect and right. the prime suspect. Yeah. That he is. Sanderson said he last saw Taylor the previous Thursday. He said that he first had met Taylor about three weeks ago. Taylor was selling pot, and Sanderson said he wanted to see what he had. A fellow student named Jeff had introduced them. So according to William Sanderson, he hardly knows this guy. He just met him a few weeks ago, and he's looking to buy some marijuana from him. Yes, and he's making it out to be like a joint or some very small amount. Yeah. He said that he'd been trying a sample on that Thursday. He said that Taylor had two other guys with him, as well as his girlfriend. So according to Sanderson, he texted Taylor on Saturday and got no response. He said he tried again on Sunday and still got no response. The investigator asked to go through Sanderson's texts on his phone, but Sanderson said when he had heard about Taylor being missing, he deleted a texting app that he had been using on his phone. He claimed that he did that because he had gotten nervous about selling and buying marijuana, and he didn't want to get into trouble over that. Well, that's one possible explanation. Sure, but there are some others, too, that are far less innocent. There are. There certainly are. But before we get into those, let's take a short break here for Madison Reed. Did you know, Dickie, that you can take coloring your hair at home to the next level? With Madison Reed? I really didn't know that because oh. I haven't dyed my hair recently. Well, let me tell you, Madison Reed gives you gorgeous professional hair color. Plus, they deliver it to your door. And guess what it costs? Less than 25 bucks. I'm sold. So Madison Reed hair color is really one of a kind, too. It's very multidimensional, giving you your choice of over 45 multitonal shades and these have all been developed by the master colorists who work for Madison Reed. They really know how to blend nuances to give you that great color. Many of our listeners have written to me to tell me how Madison Reed hair color really has improved their lives. It's a small thing, but I totally get it. Madison Reed delivers gray covering, natural looking hair color to my door just when I want it. Now I'm free from lengthy salon visits, Plus, I'm saving money and looking great. My hair is soft, strong, natural looking, and it's one less thing for me to worry about in this world of many worries. So I'm always happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. I just want you to know it's affordable, convenient, and very high quality. You know what? We're busy women. So don't you think we deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered to our doors on our schedule? And for less than 25 bucks? Absolutely. Of course, we do. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. And True Crime Brewery listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit by using our code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY at madison-reed.com. Check it out. So when we go back to what had happened that Thursday night before Taylor went missing... Uh, Sanderson said that he and Taylor had gone to an apartment close by his on Henry Street. There were two guys there sitting on a couch. And William said that Taylor ran upstairs and returned with a black duffel bag. He opened the bag and showed Sanderson about two pounds of marijuana. Sanderson said the pot just wasn't very good, so he didn't buy any of it. Well, we know now that Sanderson was lying to the police. And at this point, he began to ramble on about Taylor texting him to show him more marijuana. 
but he said he hadn't seen him since Thursday. He said he was supposed to meet Taylor on Saturday night around 10.30 after his girlfriend had left. Sanderson was at his apartment that night watching Netflix and cleaning his apartment, he said, and Taylor never showed up, he said. So Sanderson said he texted Taylor that the deal would have to wait until the next day because his girl was coming home. Once the texting app on the phone was discovered or or recovered, uh, that helped investigators confirm that he was lying. Yeah, so it seems that Sanderson wasn't all that tech savvy, even though he was a young guy because he didn't seem to think that these texts would be recovered because he deleted the app. But he was very wrong about that. He was very helpful. He offered to download the app again on the police station's Wi-Fi so they could check the texts. And he did, and they got all the texts. So police were looking over Sanderson's conversations on this texting app, and their tech expert took screenshots of the messages. At 10.24 p.m. on August 15th, Taylor texted, I'm out back of the building now. Is that your bike parked by the door? And Sanderson texted back, I'm walking out now. So we know he was lying. Police knew he was lying. So the investigator asked what happened then. And Sanderson answered that he went out back, but nobody was there. So he said that's when he went to his neighbor's apartment. And that's the one that uh, Pukiel McCabe rented. Yes. Then just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Sanderson returned to his apartment. Meanwhile, at the police station, detectives were reading the text messages from his phone. And surprisingly, or maybe not, the text didn't match his story. Well, really not at all. I mean, for one thing, the messages told them that Sanderson was expecting Taylor to show up with 20 pounds of marijuana. Not a sample joint or even 2 pounds, but 20 pounds. Huge drug deal. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big one. Yes. So later that night, Sanderson gets arrested. He was charged with kidnapping, trafficking, and misleading police. And then the very next day, he was charged with first-degree murder. Yes, on August 18th, when Sanderson was interviewed again about Taylor's disappearance, he was interviewed by Corporal Jody Allison, and I guess this was one of their best interrogators. He was actually called in to interview William Sanderson. Allison was in Ontario, and he flew back to Halifax. Investigators met with Allison and brought him up to speed on the case. And then, at 6 a.m. on the 19th, he began his lengthy interrogation of William Sanderson. Allison knew that Sanderson was planning to become a doctor, and that he had no criminal record. He explained to Sanderson that his apartment had been searched and blood was found that would be tested for DNA. And the security camera in the hallway also showed Taylor entering Sanderson's apartment. So he's recognizing now that he's caught. Sure. So he changed his story. He now said that someone came into his house when Taylor was there. He said three men came into his apartment wearing masks. Now, Sanderson tried to run to his room, but he was hit on the back of his head. And he was kind of semi-conscious. He was hearing people fighting. And one of the men had a gun. Sanderson said he stayed on the ground, and he heard the men leave. And when he looked around, he saw blood, a lot of blood. He couldn't say how long the men were there, but he thought that Taylor had left with the men. And they didn't take all of the money. So he put the money with blood on it into a bag, and he cleaned up his apartment. Yes, so this story is going to change five or six different times before we get to a trial. Yeah, well, we've got to pick this version that's going to get them off of my back, right? Well, I mean, they keep figuring things out and catching him, and then he has to modify things. Never a good thing when you have to keep changing your story. Now, it's interesting to note, though, that he did ask for an attorney several times. But in Canada, that doesn't mean that you have to stop interviewing a suspect. So it probably would have turned out a little differently in the United States. Oh, yeah. Once you ask for a lawyer, questioning's done. Yes. Although there was so much evidence, I don't know if it would have made a huge difference. But Sanderson said he wasn't sure if Taylor had left with the men or if he'd chased them out of the apartment. But Allison still was not believing Sanderson's story. 
Allison asked Sanderson about the surveillance cameras, which Sanderson had actually installed in the hallway. And Sanderson said that the cameras didn't work. He said they were supposed to record for two full days, but they would record over the video every 20 minutes. Allison pressured Sanderson, but he stuck to this story. But Sanderson was wrong about these cameras. And he just wasn't very tech savvy because he was wrong about the text app and he was wrong about the cameras. So Allison left the interrogation room and he returned with photos from these surveillance cameras. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. So it's at 10.26 p.m. on the 15th and you can see Taylor walking into Sanderson's apartment carrying a large black duffel bag. And then although Sanderson tried to clean his apartment with the bleach, copious amounts of bleach according to his girlfriend, blood was found on the walls, the furniture, and even on the money. So yeah, well, it was described as a bloodbath. Yes. And I, I don't think these guys are that adept at cleaning up blood. So you're going to leave stuff. Most people can't clean it up properly. No. It was everywhere. But the cameras had been turned off at 11.33 p.m. Sanderson said that the masked men had actually entered his apartment through a bedroom window around 11. That explained why they weren't seen on the video surveillance. And he added that the men told him to turn off the security cameras at 11.33 because they wanted to leave by the door and not be seen. So it gets really shady to me when you're asking me to believe that these men came in through a window. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, he's kind of ducking and weaving now. He's got to keep changing his story. Yeah, it's not good. Because the police keep pointing out his inconsistencies. Sure. Sanderson is changing his story again. He was now saying that there were only two men who invaded his apartment. He heard a gunshot. He saw a lot of blood on the floor. And he saw two men put Sanderson in a big black bag and leave. Yeah, there's no way you're getting this young man into a bag. I don't care how big of a bag it was. I mean, Sanderson said this is the biggest bag he had ever seen. But it's just outrageous to think that two guys could have put Taylor in a duffel bag. He was six foot five and over 200 pounds. Yeah, you're not going to be able to maneuver a body that well into a duffel. No. So that sounds a little untrue. Very untrue, I'd say. Now, Sanderson also added that the two men were not only wearing masks, they were wearing morph suits. And these are black spandex suits, uh, kind of like the ones that you see on the Blue Man group. So, yeah, so this seemed far-fetched as well. Yeah, he's just getting himself deeper and deeper. So this this came out after nine years of interrogation. Years? This <laughs> this came out after nine hours of interrogation. Yep. It was, it was lengthy. Yep, and then after that, Sanderson was charged with first-degree murder. Sanderson's neighbor, Pukil McCabe, and his friend, Justin Blades, were actually witnesses who saw Taylor in Sanderson's apartment that night, bleeding to death. But they would lie to the police and not come forward for over a year. Just four days after Taylor disappeared, Blades and McCabe were interviewed, but they told police they hadn't seen anything, and police believed them. We know nothing. Now, there was an attorney named Eugene Tan who was friendly with the Sanderson family, and when he heard about William's arrest, he called Father Michael, and Tan was asked to represent William. Uh, however, he was pretty overworked, so he got a lawyer named Brad Sarson, who worked for Nova Scotia Legal Aid, to help him. So we've got two guys on the case for William. Yes. Sanderson was in jail for a little over two months when he did have a bail hearing, and the police submitted the evidence they already had against him in their argument to keep him locked up. His parents, Lori and Michael Sanderson, testify. His parents, Lori and Michael Sanderson, testified on behalf of their son. They were ready to put up their property, including their home, for William's bail. I mean, they were really all in. Well, it's their parents. Sure. And you're going to figure your kid is innocent of anything like that. Well, yeah. I mean, they had really no reason to believe he wasn't. He'd been a pretty good kid. Right. 
Just that one tiny problem that he dealt in drugs. Problem, sure. So bail was denied, and the judge noted that even though William Sanderson had no criminal record, that did not mean that he hadn't committed crimes, just that he hadn't yet been caught. Well, yeah, they had a lot of evidence that he was a drug dealer. Quite a bit, yeah. And there's also a threat that Sanderson had made against his girlfriend five or six weeks before Taylor's murder. Sanderson had been angry that his girlfriend had cheated on him. And in a text to a friend, he said he would kill her and dump her body on his parents' property where the coyotes would get her remains. He also said he would cut off her head and hands and put them in a bucket of lye. So that's not a normal thing to say. That's pretty crazy. Even in, you know, the biggest wave of anger and betrayal, that's a really crazy thing to say. A bit extreme. One might say he overreacted. Sure. But it kind of gave you a glimpse into what his personality might have really been like. Right. Plus, again, you mentioned earlier that he was un unfriendly drunk. Yes, a couple so, people have said that. So that's some other stuff that gives some insight into what's up with William. Well, because Taylor's body hadn't been found, the judge voiced some concern also that Sanderson might tamper with evidence or even intimidate some witnesses. So Sanderson was kept in jail until his trial began, and that was over a year and a half later. The trial actually had several delays, and it lasted for two months, which is a pretty long time. Taylor Sampson's mother was in that courtroom every day. The Sanderson family wasn't at the trial, though. Apparently, they believed that they weren't allowed to be in because they may be called to testify, they thought. But that actually wasn't factual, so I'm not sure where they got that idea. There was a bit of a argument about that, where they said they were told they couldn't be there. But anyway, they weren't there. But a lot of family and friends of Taylor Sampson were at the trial. Yeah, I, I don't know who told them they couldn't attend. I mean, that's a pretty easy question to be answered. Yeah, I don't know. It's a bit of a thing. The other alternative is that they've decided that their son is guilty of killing Taylor, and they're not going to support him. Wow. Well, that's a possibility I hadn't considered, but sure. So Pukiel McCabe and Justin Blades, as you said, had finally come forward as witnesses and they were going to testify for the prosecution at Sanderson's trial. Yeah, back in August of 2015, McCabe had graduated with a business degree, and he was bartending at a casino and working at a day camp for sports when this all happened. Blades had dropped out of college due to some money problems, but he also planned to return at some point. And on that night, the two friends were planning a night out. McCabe was taking too long to get ready, in Blades' opinion, so he just went to his apartment. So Blades arrived at the apartment at 9.55 p.m. on August 15th. McCabe and Sanderson were in McCabe's apartment drinking, sharing a joint, playing video games, and they asked Sanderson if he wanted to go out with them to a party. But Sanderson declined, and he left the apartment about 15 minutes after Blades had arrived. So Blades and McCabe were in McCabe's apartment drinking when a friend texted, texted asking for some weed. A friend and another guy arrived around 10.20 p.m. They picked up a gram of pot and took off. Yeah, so those guys left just like three minutes after they had showed up, and they can be seen leaving on the surveillance video. It was only two minutes later when William Sanderson and Taylor Sampson entered Sanderson's apartment. And within a few minutes of that, Blades and McCabe heard a loud bang. So this is a little disconcerting, huh? More than that, I'd say. So one of the two guys ran to the door and locked it. Then they heard table or chair move uh, in the apartment across the hall, and then it got quiet. Then they heard Sanderson's door open, and he came over and knocked on their door. And Sanderson said, hey, it's Will. It's okay. Open the door. So I wouldn't have opened the door. Not me. <laughs> yeah, if, so. If you're thinking, geez, we just might have heard a gunshot, and they locked their door, and here's a guy maybe not pounding on it, but knocking on it, saying, let me in. Uh-uh. I'd calling, be terrified. I'd be next. Calling the police. Sure. But because they were into drugs, they weren't really into calling the police. True. Blades did unlock the door and open it, and they saw Sanderson standing there. 
Then he turned around and walked back to his apartment without saying anything more. So when he left, Blades and McCain followed him across the hall to his apartment. And as soon as they entered the door, they saw the blood all over the place. Yeah, according to McCabe and Blades, William Sanderson was in a bit of a panic. He was running around his apartment. Taylor Sampson, who they didn't know and whose face they couldn't see anyway, was slumped over with a gunshot wound to his head, and there was blood all over the floor as well as some drugs and money. Sanderson didn't say anything to them about what had happened, and they didn't see a gun. Sanderson just kept talking about needing to clean up his apartment. McCabe and Blades were very freaked out and they went back to McCabe's apartment and decided what they needed to do was tell Sanderson he needed to call the police and they wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. So they went back and they looked in Sanderson's apartment and called out that, hey, we're leaving. But they saw that he had moved the body and dragged it into the bathroom. They could see streaks of blood on the floor like the drag marks, which is just scary. It certainly is. Now, there's only three minutes that went by from the time that Sanderson had knocked on McCabe's door and the time that McCabe and Blades left the building. I bet that they didn't stick around long, huh? No, they wanted to get out of there. They didn't sleep at all that night. They were so freaked out. At the same time, they were afraid to call the police because they're worried, here's this guy with a gun, what's going to happen? So the next morning, Blades had his girlfriend drive him back to the building. He knocked on Sanderson's door. The apartment looked clean and really smelled strongly of chemicals. Yeah, so when they testified to this, Eugene Tan cross-examined McCabe and Blades and really tried to tear down their story. But the cross-examination really ended up helping the prosecution more than William Sanderson. The trial almost ended when Eugene Tan, Sanderson's lawyer, asked for a mistrial. The defense had been notified that an informer had come forward to ask about confidentiality, but then the night before, the defense had learned that the informant's name was Bruce Webb and that he was now waiving confidentiality. Bruce Webb was an investigator in the investigation firm hired by the defense lawyers. A retired police officer, Webb worked part-time for Martin & Associates Investigations. In October of 2016, Sanderson's defense team was preparing for his trial, and Bruce Webb was assigned the task of finding witnesses and seeing if he could get them to talk, and finding out how they would respond if put under pressure on the stand. That November, Blades and McCabe came forward and gave statements to the police about how they had witnessed the aftermath of Tyler Sampson's murder in William Sanderson's apartment. So Eugene Tan found this suspicious, and he contacted the private investigator. And Webb told him, well, I guess I leaned on them a little too hard. So they were nearly a month into Sanderson's trial when the defense learned that their own investigator had basically turned against the client. Webb had been in on defense strategy meetings, and Tan argued that the solicitor-client privilege had been breached. So solicitor client privilege is basically the same as attorney-client privilege here in the U.S., and it protects all communication between a legal advisor and a client. So Bruce Webb, being hired by Sanderson's attorney, should have had some privilege there, and he seemed to destroy it, really, just throw it aside for what he decided was the right thing to do. Yeah, he clearly shouldn't have divulged the conversations he had with the two guys, right? That's privileged information. Well, it's not so much divulging it as it's encouraging these guys to go to the police when he's actually on the other side of things and he knows the defense strategy. Sure, but he's also wanting them to be able to tell what happened, get to the bottom of things. Yeah, he's basically looking for the truth instead of looking out for the client. The judge responded to Tan that asking for a mistrial was premature, at least at that point. A voir dire was set up with the jury out of the the room to determine the facts of the situation. Bruce Webb was subpoenaed to testify, and he said that Adam Sanderson, William's brother, had put Blades in touch with Webb. 
Yeah, so according to Webb, Blades wanted to tell the police what he knew. He'd been in hiding, actually, for over a year because he believed that Sanderson had been getting his drugs from the Hells Angels. And he believed if he testified against Sanderson, he could be killed by the Hells Angels. So he was pretty terrified. But Webb tried to convince him there's no way that Sanderson is involved with the Hells Angels. Right, and then Webb was asked if he had encouraged Blades to speak to the police. He said that he had facilitated a meeting between Blades and the police. Webb had a neighbor, Staff Sergeant Lane, who was a police officer, and Webb told him that Blades had looked in an, into Sanderson's apartment and he had seen Taylor Sampson's body. Now, Webb admitted to being motivated in part because he believed that Sanderson was guilty and he didn't want a guilty man to get away with murder. So there you have it. He thinks he's doing the right thing. But maybe not in the right way. Lane was called in to testify, and much of what he said contradicted Webb's testimony. Lane said that Webb told him he was concerned that the police weren't doing enough to investigate. He said he was aware of a couple of witnesses who would give statements that would be helpful. So according to Lane, Webb had said he was motivated to help Blades get his life back to normal because the memories of the murder and all that stuff were really overwhelming him. Now, Sanderson's girlfriend, Sonia, testified that she had talked to Bruce Webb, and he told her things weren't looking too good for Sanderson. She says that she was encouraged to back away from her relationship with Sanderson. Tom Martin, who was Webb's employer, testified that Webb had signed a confidentiality agreement, and he had seriously breached it. He said that he had spoken with Webb, and Webb had told him he had not said anything to Blades about going to the police. And because of this, Martin didn't go to the defense with any concerns about Webb. Okay, but Webb admitted that he was at strategy meetings with the defense. And the police had no plans to follow up with Blades or McCabe prior to the trial, so they said it was likely that they wouldn't have spoken with the police if they hadn't been contacted by Webb. Yeah. The defense argued that Sanderson was not getting a fair trial because of what Webb had done. But the prosecution argued that even though the police had not made plans to re-interview Blades and McCabe, both men would have been subpoenaed to testify before the end of the trial. So after five days, the judge denied the defense's request for a new trial. And I can see that Webb definitely did something wrong here but I don't know that it would change the outcome of this trial because the witnesses are already out there. They're already going to talk to police. Well, probably, uh, but I, I agree with you. I think uh, Webb overstepped his boundaries. He did. Yeah, I think so. And I would have declared a mistrial. Yeah, I'm just saying with the new trial, what are you going to do? I mean, Blades and well, McCabe I, have to come forward. I know. You're, you're probably going to end up in the same place. Exactly. But... Uh, I think they should have called a mistrial. Okay, but I don't think it would have changed anything is what I'm saying. I know. Okay, but, but I see what you're saying. That's part of the, uh, the results justify the means. Okay, well, okay, so, but regardless of the means, I think you'd have the same result. You probably would have. Yep. But we don't know. No, but I think that's something the judge has to take into consideration. I'm not a lawyer, but it's a big deal to have a mistrial and start over. And if you think something's not going to change the outcome, it's probably not worth starting over. Well, but that's not part of the decision. No, I thought it was. Well, it shouldn't be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think legally it is. I think that's a big part of it is if it's not going to change things, you're not going to declare a mistrial. And maybe one of our lawyers out there, we have a few lawyers that listen, can clarify that for us. But I'm pretty sure of that in my head. Okay. I'd like to hear that. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about it, too. So I hope someone will write in to us. Detective Constable Jonathan Jeffries testified that he was working in the homicide unit, and he coordinated the search of the Sanderson farm and the surrounding areas. Behind the farmhouse down a narrow walking path, gloves were found that looked like the pair Sanderson is seen wearing on the surveillance video outside of his apartment. Yes, searchers recovered a shower curtain, a large black duffel bag, and some other evidence at the farm. 
The duffel bag was very similar to the one Taylor Sampson was seen carrying the night he disappeared. Garbage bags and an Adidas sports bag were also found, and they were inside of an old ice cream truck out on the farm. There was staining visible on the Adidas bag, and there was a very strong odor of decomposition coming from that bag as well. There was a shower curtain in the garbage bag and a roll of paper towels that was soaked. The paper towels smelled very strongly of cleaner. A bottle of Lysol spray and a letter that was addressed to William Sanderson were also seized from the family farm. So this is all very damning. <laughs> it certainly is. A search of Adam Sanderson's apartment turned up three containers of marijuana from the basement of the building. Drugs were in a small appliance box, a backpack, and a grocery bag. Now the containers and the drugs were entered as evidence and shown to the jury. Taylor's body was not found and has not been found. In the trial, there was a lot of testimony about blood and blood spatter also. Sanderson's clothing was photographed and there were areas of staining on his shoes, which reacted as blood in the presumptive test. But there was not enough to get a DNA profile. They had a DNA profile from Taylor's razor and water bottle, also from getting swabs from his parents, and swabs from Sanderson's bathroom, table, and kitchen flooring match Taylor's DNA. So that's super damning. Also, a bullet was found in the window frame, and it too had Taylor's DNA on it. Taylor's DNA was also found on carpet from the trunk of Sanderson's car, a tarp found on the farm, the shower curtain that was found on the farm, and inside of the black duffel bag. So it wasn't looking good for Sanderson. <laughs> Not at all, was it? It's all pretty damning. And there were 40 spatter stains on the handgun slide, several on the handle. Now, these were identified as back spatter, and the expert determined that the gun was two to four feet away from Taylor when he was shot. But there was not enough blood on the gun to confirm it was Taylor's. Well, they found his DNA on a lot of things, just not on the gun. I mean, they found DNA in the bathroom, in the table, on the kitchen flooring. It was all Taylor's. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't a large enough amount on the gun to do a profile on. This were tiny little spatters, I guess. Yeah. Well, the same thing with Sanderson's clothing and shoes. There was blood on them, but they couldn't get a DNA profile. Well, I mean, there must have been extensive cleaning done to everything, and I would guess that was why. You bet. Yeah. So the prosecution thought that Sanderson's motive for killing Taylor was a financial one. His drug deal with Taylor was worth $40,000, and his street value was $90,000. So you can double your money. That's right, yeah. Once it's all sold. But that wasn't good enough for him. Now, he had a $200,000 line of credit for school, but he had already used up 125000 or so of it. He was down to 73000 in July of 2015. He was transferring money from the credit line often, usually over $3,000 a month. Yeah, so this isn't just a matter of a poor student. He was kind of spoiled and spent a lot of money. You know, maybe that was just part of the whole drug dealer thing. I don't know. But he was taking a lot of money from this credit line. And this was money for med school. And he hadn't even started his classes yet. Yeah, and he's, he's down uh, a lot of money. Yeah. Two-thirds of it or so. So, this isn't good. <laughs> he's going to get halfway through med school and have no money. Sure. Yeah, money's gone. Yeah. They did find texts with his parents and with a friend where Sanderson was really stressing out about money. He had an apartment he was paying for. He also had a motorcycle, a truck, and a car. I don't know why. And he was due to begin classes in a few days. And of course, they are not cheap, and that's what the money was for. That's what it was for. Tuition. Now, there's a fellow drug dealer who Sanderson knew very well had had his home invaded just two days before Taylor went missing. Three men broke into this guy's apartment, attacked him in his bed, and took some weed and some mushrooms. Now, he hadn't called the police because he was involved in drug dealings. So the defense had this person testify in an effort to show that an apartment of a fellow drug dealer had been invaded. So maybe Sanderson's apartment had been invaded. Sure, I mean, 
It's all they've got, really. I think they're kind of desperate for things to defend him. I can't imagine at this point that many people thought he was innocent. I don't think so. William Sanderson did not take the stand in his own defense. His attorney argued in closing statements that Sanderson was not in financial distress, as he still had over $70,000 available to him. He also claimed that the investigation and evidence were flawed, but he ended up talking about reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt, that's important in the defense of someone, for sure. But I don't see a lot of it here didn't work. But there was a long deliberation. There were over 22 hours of deliberations before the jury came out with a verdict. Sanderson's family wasn't there, and they said that William had requested that they not be there. I think he had a pretty good idea where this was going. He was found guilty of first-degree murder, and this conviction meant a life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. Taylor's family wanted Taylor's body found, but Sanderson just would not reveal where it was. Taylor's mom even yelled out at him a couple times, tell us where he is. So it's just horrible. He would not say where the body was, wouldn't admit to anything, just continuing deny, deny, deny. Well, he has to. If he tells them where the body is, that means he can't or probably can't claim that he didn't do anything to him. I know, but he's already found guilty. I mean, why not just admit it and try and make some kind of... He might have been found guilty, but he says he didn't do it. Yeah. Okay, but I think he was looking very guilty. (laughs) He certainly was. In a notice filed after his conviction, Sanderson argued that the judge should not have allowed the evidence police got from his phone to be presented to the jury. And he also brought up the solicitor-client privileges that were breached by Bruce Webb when Bruce told the police about McCabe and Blades changing their stories. So he requested a new trial, and that that be for second-degree murder. He also sued his roommate, as an aside, after his conviction, claiming that the roommate stole some of his shoes. Apparently, Sanderson collected expensive sneakers, and he had 28 pair when his apartment was searched in August of 2015. 18 were missing, and the roommate was ordered to pay Sanderson $700 for the shoes plus court costs. <laughs> so he was selling his sneaker collection? Selling it? I don't know. Taking it, that's for sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, he, did. he probably thought it was, you know, fair game, right? Oh, He's probably, going to prison sure. for life. What's he going to do with them? But also the college, Dalhousie University, changed its medical school admission requirements after this. They had been screening for many non-academic qualities like extracurriculars, volunteering, and employment. But now they're trying to address a candidate's communication and collaboration skills. And evaluators are allowed to red flag applications if they have any concerns. The personal essay had been used to look for evidence of empathy and ethical decision-making But there was no way to determine if the applicant even wrote the essay himself, or of course, if it was genuine. It's impossible to measure a person's integrity, really, especially in cases of sociopaths or narcissists, because they're usually really quite good at hiding their true feelings and who they really are. So it's really a hard thing to determine when you're taking applicants. How can you screen for that? Well, you really can't. Maybe if you had all the interviews with uh, a psychiatrist or something. I don't know. Yeah, do they do a psychological profile of med students before they enter? No. Well, maybe they should. Because, you know, if you're concentrating too much on the academics, I know plenty of really smart people who just have no common sense and poor ethics. And it would be more important to me to have a physician who cares and has their head on straight than someone who's just super smart. Well, yeah. But you can also maybe be able to identify people that you wouldn't want as doctors in an interview. In an interview or by doing a psychological exam? No, I'll go with an interview. Okay, so who would be doing the interview and making those judgments? Well, that's what you got to figure it out. (laughs) I don't have it all deeply planned Okay, well, you make a plan and get back to me. I will do that. Okay. But it's not going to be worthwhile because I don't think there's any... (laughs) reasonable way you can identify. And and even if you could say, 
this guy is a psychopath. Not every psychopath kills people. Sure, that's true. So it could be kind of not a good thing to do, I guess. I don't know. It's really something worth thinking okay. about, I guess. Yeah, we can think about that. Yeah, but I mean, plus you might have the interviewer being prejudiced in some ways. So it would never really be foolproof at all. No. I mean, all you can really judge a person by is their past, what they've done in the past, and what they say to you. Yeah, and even then it might not be enough. Right, exactly. I and mean, just remember when we did Michael Swango. That, double that O Swango. Double O. Uh, <laughs> He had a lot of attendings, a lot of important physicians really pleased with him and sticking up for him. That's true. But most of his contemporaries were like, whoa, double O swango. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but he still had some people in high places who said he was great. That's true. I mean, I, I don't want to be too much of a downer, but I, I don't think you're going to be able to winnow out people that wouldn't be good physicians. Right. You're probably right. But I'll wait for your written plan before I make any decisions. I'll, I'll have one for you soon. Okay. By morning, I'm hoping. Well, maybe morning. It, it might be a little <laughs> later. Okay. There's a football game I want to watch. <laughs> so Sanderson's appeal hearing is coming up very soon. It's scheduled for January 2020. Yeah, it's been delayed a couple times, so we'll see if it happens. If you'd like to learn more about this case, I'd really refer you to the Global News Canada website articles, which are just great. They have pictures and information. Also, there's a book that we used as a source, and it's titled First Degree from Med School to Murder by Kayla Hounsel. That's just chock-a-block full of information. It's a good book. We'd like to thank Deb, who lives in Montreal, for suggesting this case. I'd never heard of it, and it was just fascinating. So thanks, Deb. Good idea. We'd like to thank Tristan Capel for producing our music. And also T Public for putting our logos on some really nice, reasonably priced products. This time of year is a great time to buy hoodies and other warm clothes, and we don't spend much time promoting T Public as much as they would like us to, but they really do do a great job. And you can check out TCB items by clicking on shop at tigrebber.com. So a little more self promotion before feedback. Have you ever considered being a tie grabber? It's a bargain, and we've had a lot of fun with these episodes lately, haven't we, Dickie? We're enjoying it. Yeah, for example, we're planning to do a Halloween special for members, and this will be like an on-true crime movie episode where we talk about the Halloween movies from 1978 and 2018, because I believe these are by far the best two Halloweens. The ones in between are basically crap. Except maybe Halloween H2O was an exception. That one wasn't too bad. That had Jamie Lee in it. We have over 30 members-only TCB episodes available for you now, and we just released our October episode on Christopher Wilder, otherwise known as the Beauty Queen Killer. There were some horrible aspects to these murders, including the abduction of girls and women from shopping malls, and some torture and terrible things that he did to these people. There's also at least one story of escape and another story of him letting a victim go. So if you want to join, just go to tigrebber.com and click on subscribe. Now we have options to join with monthly, quarterly, and annual plans. And another new feature is that new members get to choose their welcome gift. You can choose a snifter, which is Dick's go-to beer drinking glass, a steel wallet sized bottle opener, or a set of four coasters. And along with that, you're going to get stickers, magnets, buttons, things like that. So let's move on for just a short feedback segment today. If you'd like to leave a voicemail, just go to tigrebber.com and click on the Leave a Voicemail tab on the homepage. Or you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrebber.com or leave us a message on social media. We're on Twitter at tigrebberpods, and you can find us on Instagram and Facebook. We also have a closed group on Facebook that you're welcome to join. This is called True Crime Brewery Fan Discussions page. And many of our listeners go there and chat. It's a great place to visit. All right, Dickie, what have you got for feedback? I got the usual. I got one voicemail and a couple emails. We'll do the voicemail first. This is from Elsa, and she has some comments to make. Hi, True Crime Brewery. I am calling because I actually have a question for you. 
I am wondering about your opinions and the choice you made to include sort of the recap of the episode that you're going to do before. I don't know a good phrase for it, but how you introduce the episode, sometimes you go into so much detail. It is personally not my preference. I like a little bit of a surprise. And so I'm sure you'll have an excellent reason for this. And I am just curious as to why you include those details in the beginning of an episode before you get into the storytelling. All right. Um, I would love an answer. It's really just a curiosity to me. So thanks so much. I love podcast and appreciate your hard work. Bye. Well, thank you, Elsa. Now, this kind of made me laugh because we just had a discussion about this a day or two ago. We did. I really like to write my introductions and try and give everybody a taste of what's coming up at the episode. And Dick thinks I probably get too detailed in that. And he's probably right. So it's something we've debated. And I don't know if you've noticed over the past few months, I have tried to leave a little more mystery, but it's hard for me. Yeah, sometimes you don't want to necessarily give everything away. (laughs) Yes. So... That's our goal. But as far as saying how we came up with that decision, I don't know. I just really like to do it. I like to sit down and write up a little summary, and I'm trying to make it a little more mysterious. But I don't think I can ever totally get away from it, because I do enjoy that part. Yeah, and and it's also, it's not a conscious decision (laughs) to be too wordy or not wordy enough. I mean, it's just you're putting down on paper an intro. I'll bet if you did this one tomorrow, you might do a lot differently. Yeah, you never know. But I do think it's a good idea to leave it a little more mysterious. Elsa isn't the only one who's had that preference to not know everything. Oh, that's correct. Which I totally understand, and you agree as well. There we are. So that's all I can say about that. All right, we have an email from Talana with a case suggestion. Talana says, I enjoy your podcast very much. I'm currently listening to December 2016 and wanted to say hello from Wisconsin. If you haven't already, may I suggest doing a podcast on David Rothenberg and or Bambi Bembenik. Keep on doing what you're doing. All right. So Bambi we've done. Yes, I think she's a members only episode, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. It is. So maybe. So that's probably why she hasn't seen that. And the other one, uh, the Rothenberg case, I'm looking into that. It's very interesting. He uh, was drugged and set on fire by his father when he was a little six-year-old kid. Holy shit. His parents were divorced, and they were in this bitter custody battle. He took his kid, his little boy, to Disney World or Disneyland, and in the hotel, drugged the kid, doused the bed and him with lighter fluid, and set him on fire. So he has third-degree burns over 90% of his body, and somehow he survived. So... It's not a murder. It's an attempted murder, if that makes a difference. But, you know, he, he survived somehow and actually had a, a fairly productive life. Okay, but this is the kind of just heinous fuckery that I hate. I mean, a custody battle? Don't you think this was clearly done to get back at his ex-wife? Using the child as a pawn? Of course it was. That's just horrendous. I can't think of anything much more selfish than this. And I hope that father's rotting in prison if he's still alive. But I give David a lot of credit. What a brave, brave boy. Yeah, and he uh, hung out with some famous people. Is he an adult now? Well, he would be. He's dead from uh, complications of pneumonia. Oh, so that sounds like maybe his health wasn't 100% after this. Well, no, he couldn't be. Okay. Well, I was kind of getting a nice feeling thinking he was okay and had a full life. He, he did. It just ended too early. Okay. I think he was 42 when he died and he was six when he was horribly burned. I just can't imagine that suffering. That father is a terrible, terrible person. Yeah. And the mother, think how she must feel. She must feel guilty and miserable and very sad that this happened to her son. Yeah. I mean, she was probably trying to get away from this guy to make a better life for her and her son. And then this happens. It's just terrible. Horrible story. Yeah. So we'll check it out. Okay. And then I have uh, one more case suggestion from Ashkan. Ashkan writes, First of all, I really want to say that I love your podcast. 
I'm a huge fan of true crime, and your insightful commentary on each case is very fascinating. As a biomedical engineer, I appreciate Dick's incorporation of his medical knowledge into the case. There's an interesting case with Roxanne Galunas being murdered. She's the wife of a doctor, and she's a nurse. So Dr. Peter Galunas and his wife were in the midst of a divorce when she was killed by an intruder. She was having an affair with a contractor who was doing work on the house, and her husband was initially a suspect, but attention soon went to the contractor and his wife. Sounds like a tangled web. It's a quite a tangled web, and I'm not going to divulge the final story just yet. Well, Elsa will appreciate that. Because we, <laughs> we might want to talk about it sometime. We might. That's true. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for spending some time with us today at The Quiet End. And big thanks to everyone who's offered support by becoming tie grabbers and to those who have called and written with their feedback. We really appreciate it. We certainly do. And you've been giving us some good cases. I think I have enough cases to do for the next 10 years. Yes, I think that you do. So we'll see you all next time at the quiet end. Take care. I'll save a beer for you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.